Let's talk a bit about tennis and golfer elbow. Tennis elbow, of course, is a very, very frequent lesion. It could be also a very annoying lesion, could also be very acute. Um, what's, what's a little bit the background of it? Well, in many cases, in many cases, it's kind of an overused phenomenon. It is a repetitive strain injury. People who are constantly involved with extension activities of the wrist. Uh, cleaning ladies, uh, working a lot with, uh, with a desktop com computer but in a non-ergonomical position, uh, people who work in a factory and have to do repetitive movements all the time. So this is a, a basic element. Sometimes it's post-traumatic but that's not so uh, frequent. But we see, we see many so-called chronic tennis elbows. Yeah? It started one day and they didn't get any, any real active treatment that influences the scar tissue. So nature is taking care of everything. You have the inflammation phase, you have the repair phase, the remodeling phase. But during the repair and the remodeling phase, you get <coughs> adhesive scar tissue, which could play a role in chronic lesions. So when the patient doesn't, doesn't to put too much loading on his elbow, then activities of daily life are more or less okay. But the moment he does some more intense activity, it is, it is not okay. So it's a story of constantly upside down. Yeah? Better periods, worse periods, better periods. Chronic lesions are difficult ones to treat. But a tennis elbow very often has a very typical story. So one element you already heard yeah? in the story, you have a lot of a lot of repetitive extension activity, and they say they have pain over here, most likely with some radiation in that direction. In acute cases, there's certainly radiation. Sometimes radiation until until the middle three fingers, yeah? and any activity involving extension is is very annoying. Yeah? When they pour out, when they pour out the coffee in the morning, for instance, ah, painful. Yeah, sometimes, sometimes they just they just drop things. Uh, when a patient comes in and you say hello to the patient, hi, hi, what can I do for you? How are you? Yeah, just by shaking hands, and he says, ha, ah, it hurts. You're practically sure he has a tennis elbow type two. So it's it's really very obvious. And what do you find in the examination? Well, you're resisted extension from the basic examination, of course, quite painful. With acute lesions, you're going to have pain and weakness, but not weakness because there is some rupture or so. No, if you ask for a full contraction, it's going to look like this. <coughs> pain and weakness because it hurts too much. Yeah. As an extra test, fist movement, Again, extension, again, quite painful. And sometimes, sometimes the radial deviation against resistance is also painful. Yeah? And then the question, of course, is, are we talking about extensor carpe radialis longus and or brevis? Well, in literature, they describe an extra test for the brevis. You could do a resisted extension of the middle finger that could be positive, but it's not 100% reliable. So the more reliable way to make a differentiation between longus and brevis is going to be palpation. Yeah? So, as I mentioned earlier, repetitive strain injury is an element that plays a role, as well as adhesive scar tissue. And we may not underestimate also the role of degeneration and some relative avascularity. So I think that a combination of those elements plays the biggest role in a tennis elbow. But then the major question, what are we going to do with it? Well, in the Syriax approach, we're going to do a deep transverse friction massage. Sometimes we combine it with a Mills manipulation, but that's not 100% guarantee for success no we have to be honest there are there are tennis elbows which don't react 100 percent 
on the strategy of friction manipulation, uh, friction manipulation and stretching. Right? The only problem is we never know that in advance. It would be very nice to know that in advance, but unfortunately we don't. Stretching techniques, shockwave could also be an alternative. Um, infiltration, one little detail about infiltration, it should be on the correct spot. And there's only one type which is infiltrated, this is type 2. Right? In total we have four or five different types, so infiltration is exclusively for type 2. Perhaps surgery, perhaps some other options. There's also a mechanism of spontaneous evolution. So if uh, we don't give any treatment, more or less in about one year time, it recuperates reasonably. But of course, we're not going to wait one year. When the patient got an infiltration with corticosteroid, the spontaneous evolution does not work anymore. Well, four different types. In some books you find five types, so if you want, I, I can also give you five, that's no problem. Type number one is the origin of the extensor carpi radialis longus. Type number two, the most, the most painful one, the most acute one, the most annoying one, is extensor carpi radialis brevis, the origin. Type three is the tendinous body of the brevis, and here you can, you can make a distinction, 3A and 3B if you want. There could be a lesion at the height of the joint line, but there could also be a lesion at the height of the radial head. And then type 4 finally is the muscle belly. So as I told you, type 2, hmm, let's say in 90% of the cases we talk about type 2. But it happens sometimes that you have a combination of types. Patient has type 1 and 2 at the same time, or 2 and 3 at the same time. Well, that's just more work for you. Well, it's again very important that we manage our palpations in a good way. That we really have a good specific palpation. This is the palpation for type 1. The important thing is we have to be on the anterior border of the humerus. Yeah? Type 2, very important over here for a type 2 is you really have to flex your thumb and we palpate and we friction with the tip of our thumb on the anterior aspect of the lateral epicondyle. Always use a layer of cotton wool because otherwise you're going to damage the skin. This is, this is really a very, a very tiring technique. Not for the patient but for the therapist. Yeah? Not to be underestimated. Type 3, we're going to change the position of the patient. So for type 1 and 2, the position of the arm was 90 degrees. For type 3, we're going to 3 quarters of extension and pronation. And then with a flat position thumb, we're going to take a contact uh, on the tendon at the height of the radial head or at the uh, joint line. And then finally, type 4, we're going to squeeze the muscle belly. And then exclusively for type 2, we're going to perform a Mills manipulation. Well, in fact, if you summarize, if you summarize the treatment strategy for a type 2, we're going to do 15 minutes of deep friction type 2, followed by one manipulation. We do that two, three times a week, and you need an average, an average of 12 to 15 sessions. Don't give up too soon. It happens, it happens really often that the first seven or eight treatments, it's not that better, and, and the patient is losing his courage. And then treatment number eight, the patient is coming in with a big smile, and he says, ah, oh, since your last treatment, it's now I start to feel a difference. Now it's better. So don't give up too soon. Average of 12 to 15 treatments, maximum three times a week. And in between, at home, the patient also has to do some stretch exercise. This Mills manipulation is not that easy. It's a, a nice test for the rhythm in your blood, so to speak. Actually, it has not been developed by Syriacs, that's logical. It has been developed by Mr. Mills already in 1928, but Syriacs in due time made some modifications. 
And what is the purpose? What is the purpose of this Mills manipulation? Well, elongate adhesions interfering with the mobility of the tendon and so on. A golfer elbow is far less frequent than a tennis elbow and it's also less invalidating and, and most likely also less acute. The patient, the patient describes some pain over here, sometimes, sometimes some radiation, but not too much, mostly it's local pain. And in the story again, you hear the key factor in the story is a kind of repetitive strain injury or occasionally a trauma. Well, um, what do you find in your examination, your resisted wrist flexion, of course, is painful. But it is possible that your resisted pronation is also painful. And what is the reason for that? The pronator teres lies over there. Partially originates from the common flexor origin. So if there is a problem with the flexor origin and you do an intensive pronation, some tension could be referred and the patient says, ow. We have two types. We have a tenoperiostal type, which you can infiltrate or you do the friction. And we have the musculotendinous junction type. Uh, keep in mind, the musculotendinous junction is always friction massage. It's never infiltration. Okay? The trick, the trick to, to do a good palpation is keep the elbow in full extension. Yeah? And then you have to, for the tenoperiostal aspect, you really have to palpate on the anterior aspect of the medial epicondyle. <coughs> you don't have to friction the medial epicondyle, you have to be on the anterior aspect. But if you are a little bit too far in that direction, then of course you're going to friction nervus medianus. And this is not the purpose. That's logical. Well, let's have a look at all those treatment techniques in a live version. So enjoy your discovery. The starting position is 90 degrees elbow flexion and supination. We palpate the lateral aspect of the lateral epicondyle. We put our thumb a little bit higher until we reach the sharp edge just above the lateral epicondyle. We flex the thumb 90 degrees so that the thumbnail now faces forwards. A reserve of skin is given upwards and pressure is applied on the anterior aspect of humerus. The active phase of the deep friction is an arm movement, downwards with pressure in a posterior direction, followed, as always, by a phase of relaxation. The standing position is three quarters of extension and pronation. We have to check two localizations the tendon level with the joint line or level with the radial head. The thumb is put as flat as possible on the lesion. A reserve of skin is taken in a medial direction, pressure is applied and the active phase of the deep friction is a movement in a lateral direction. Make sure you perform an arm movement instead of an isolated finger movement. The starting position is 90 degrees flexion and supination. Level with the neck of the radius, a pinching grip with all fingers is used. We pinch the muscle belly. The therapist stands at the posterior aspect of the patient, the proximal foot at the height of the patient's shoulder. Always check the range of extension first. 180 degrees is a minimum range required. The patient's shoulder is in medial rotation. Three elements have to be built in. Maximal wrist flexion, the therapist's thumb between thumb and index finger of the patient, maximal elbow extension, and finally a step sideways behind the patient's back in order to increase the tension. These elements have to be coordinated and the manipulation itself then becomes a combination of these three elements.
we keep the elbow in complete extension. We find the medial epicondyle and proceed to the front of it. At the teneperiostal junction, deep friction is a straight line movement and the feel is rather hard. At the musculotendinous junction, about 1 cm more distally, the deep friction is a more ample round movement and the feel is softer. The patient sits with his arm lying on the couch. His elbow is flexed 90 degrees with his forearm in full supination. The therapist applies his thumb to the anterior aspect of the epicondyle, with his fingers on the ulnar side of the elbow, and ascertains the boundaries of the tender spot. The needle is inserted vertically, just medial to the tip of the thumb, until it pierces the tendinous insertion and hits the bone. First, a droplet is injected here. One continues with injecting 20 or so droplets into the area of tenderness, several superficial injections and several more deeply. The patient sits with his arm lying on the couch. His elbow is flexed 90 degrees with his forearm in mid-rotation. The tender spot in the muscle belly is held pinched between thumb and index fingers. The needle is inserted distally to the tender spot and obliquely through the brachioradialis muscle until it hits the radius. It is now slowly withdrawn until it lies between the pinching fingers. The infiltration is given fanwise and also with some reinsertions more superficially and more deeply until the entire lesion has been infiltrated. The patient sits with his arm lying on the couch. The elbow is in extension and held fully supinated. The therapist places his thumb on the most tender spot, anterior on the medial epicondyle. The needle is inserted vertically until resistance of the tendon is felt. One droplet is injected here. Using the same technique previously described in curing the type 2 tennis elbow, the rest of the solution is injected.